All right, guys, Strong Life Podcast. I don't know if I've ever done a live Strong Life Podcast. This is the first one. We're gonna do a little round table introduction, okay, with my good friends, Joey Satmary, Coach Joey Sat, Anthony Deal, Meathead Professor, and they're gonna give a little bit of an intro. I've known Joey for a long time. He actually did the Underground Strength Coach certification here, which you said was, you were 20? That was probably 20, 21, man. He was a young, he was a young kid, as said, and Jerky Boys. <laughs> Do you know Jerky Boys, by the way? Yeah. Most people, if they're like under the age of 40, yeah. Yeah, he's like, how old are you? You sound like a young kid. Okay. And then we got Anthony Deal, me and a professor. We have got connected from the um, app that we use, Turnkey Coach, from our friend Matt Reynolds and uh, Andrew, who runs the whole uh, like infrastructure there. He introduced me to Anthony, who's crushing it online. So let's do a little introduction for anybody that doesn't know you guys. And then we're going to, we've got some kind of, we've just been shooting the shit for the past 45 minutes. We're going to let it rip. So go ahead, Joey. What do you got? Yeah. What's up, guys? Coach Joe. I've known Zach, like I said, for over 10 years. Uh, He was kind of the guy on YouTube at the time when I was kind of figuring out what I want to do with strength training, kind of run the business. So Definitely a mentor figure, now friends, which is super cool to kind of see where I was when I started to where I'm at today. I uh, had a, a gym for about seven years, strength and conditioning facility, which is awesome. Now I do all my fitness stuff remotely, so there's a change there, but you know, all for the better, really pumped about that. Uh, I've competed in a lot of strength sports. The only one I haven't competed in is powerlifting, but done strongman competitively, CrossFit, Olympic weightlifting. I do BJJ, all sorts of stuff, college athlete, you name it, I'm just very passionate about strength training fitness and helping as many people as possible um but yeah outside of that man just love networking talking to zach anthony getting out here it always gets my creative brain flowing and picking up new ideas and just being around like-minded individuals so kind of it i'm sure we'll talk about more things as we get this conversation going but that's kind of kind of me in a nutshell you're a dangerous man that's that's what i'm getting here okay (laughs) (laughs) it's a dangerous man take note (laughs) what do we got ant yeah, uh, my name is Anthony Deal. Uh, on Instagram as Meathead Professor. Uh, there's a story behind that. I do teach a logic course to high schoolers two days a week. Um, so in a former life, I was a pro strongman, one America's strongest man in 2020. Like Joey here, I, uh, I've never competed in powerlifting. I've done strongman. I also compete in jujitsu and I've competed in bodybuilding as well. Um, I do a lot of online coaching. Most of my clients are lifestyle clients at this point. I do have a good stable of competitors. I love working with bodybuilders. It's a lot of fun, but I'm just passionate about helping people get strong, but then also helping people own their own health and take it seriously because it's important. So um, I enjoy helping people, you know, add 50 pounds to their deadlift, but I also want to see people be around for their kids and grandkids, right? And um, be strong for all of life, which is a little bit different than just setting PRs in the gym. I want them to set life PRs too. Yeah, big, um, like the theme of the Strong Life podcast is True strength transcends the gym wall. So you can lift a lot of weight. You're maybe big, you're ripped, you, whatever that is. But then what does that look like outside? And a um, little history on that is it really hit me two ways. Number one, when I opened my first warehouse location, there were I was right next to a commercial gym. And some of those guys were older than me when I started at that gym as teenager, as a teen, then they were kind of coming, they were talking to me about life and how their life was in shambles. And one guy said, I'm about to jump off the rooftop of my apartment building. And I was like, man, he's ripped. He's just in great shape. He's got a high end car. Everything looked great. And then he's like, man, I'm about to fucking end it here. And then another guy, same thing, was kind of talking about how his life was a wreck, relationships, everything. And I said to myself, this can't be the way. You can't be the strongest guy in the gym, but where's the missing link of applying it? And so at the Underground Strength Conference, the first one 12 years ago, the Ultimate Warrior said, it's easy to be a badass under a barbell. He's like, but how about you do it in your life? And that hit home for me. And I always say, like, my life isn't perfect. Everything, business not perfect, relationships not perfect. But I'm always trying to take these lessons to apply it. That's, of course, the theme I get from you guys is, like, that constant self-improvement. So we've been chatting about a lot of topics when you guys 
came in. We've been talking about life and talking about some of our friends in special forces, talking about training as we get older. Joey just got married, so um, let's, we should start with the youngest. Joe is 30, 31, what'd you say? 30, 31, yeah. 31, we should, we're gonna let you pick first uh, topic that we get into. Yeah, I mean, I think we can talk maybe a little bit about life and training, kind of like you said, outside. Yep. So one thing I didn't mention is I coach high school lacrosse, and I'm by no means the master when it comes to X's and O's, especially nowadays when I played, you know, it's like 2012 or younger. Uh, but now the game's evolved. But with my coaching philosophy, everything that we try to translate on the field, I try to redirect to how it can help outside as well. So. It's almost like when they, or my goal at least, is when the kids graduate or go on, they can reflect and be like, man, I think Coach Joe was talking about something a little bit deeper when we're going through these drills. You know what I mean? And and it's kind of subliminal, but at the same time, uh, I think there's so many lessons that you can learn from training that do transcend. And obviously being the youngest guys, I can cue you in because you're a little bit older. Like maybe what are some of those lessons that you've learned in the gym that you think are pinnacle to outside. I don't know if you guys have any right off the top of your head. What's interesting is we all work with high school yeah. kids. So obviously here at the underground, and then I'm a full-time strength coach. But yesterday when I was coaching, I coached from seven to 10. <clears throat> I found myself talking to the athletes about life stuff. Like, hey guys, excellence. This group that trained before us left water bottles and garbage on the floor. Let's be better and not step over. Yeah. You see garbage pick it up and start taking pride in building this school and this culture. And so I'm trying to teach them, yeah, those little things like what you're saying, it sounds, I think when a teenager hears it, they might be like, oh, this shit again. But then they start leaning in a little bit and picking up and realizing, oh, this is actually leadership. And so what, how do you kind of blend that in? Because you're in a classroom setting, Anthony, at the school. Well, in a classroom setting, I mean, it's a little different. Um, you know, naturally, every time I step up to teach the, the kids, when I first started, like, how much do you bench, bro? Yes. Which I think is actually really important. It's good for you because you have a good bench. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. That's for right. Me, I'm like, why do you care about You're like, you know, who cares? Who cares about that? Um, well, I think it's important as a, as a teacher, I immediately had gravitas with those kids. Like, they, now I had to continue to earn that and then, yeah. and then prove it. Um, but they respected me simply because of the way I carried myself and things like that. So that's really cool. So I immediately had influence with them. Um, so I think that's important, but, uh, speaking to this in my, my own client situation, uh, I'm checking with my clients every week and specifically around nutrition. I'm always asking them about sleep, hunger, energy, digestion, stress. And when you get to that stress component and you start building a relationship with people, um, they're going to pour out all of their struggles around finances and relationships and wayward children and this stuff going on. And you begin to realize like strength training, uh, it's kind of a metaphor for life and nutrition. um, It's really, it's not rocket science unless someone has some kind of disease or metabolic issue. It can get a little complex, um, but it's really about behaviors and you're, you're getting like deep into the why that people do things. Yep. Um, and so it can get deep really fast. I think strength training just serves to open those doors. And specifically though, with young men, as you're coaching young men, um, specifically, I think men, um, do better when they're doing things side by side, right? Oh, yeah. Women might do great to like sit around at a coffee shop and share their feelings. Right. Guys just aren't that way, but we'll go train together. That guy can tell you about wanting to end it all and jump off it in the context of training, but he's probably not going to just open up to you over a cup of coffee at Starbucks. True. So I think training opens doors for those, for influence. It's a vehicle. That's right. And I would be lying if I said, this is important for coaches out there, people didn't judge us by our appearance. That's step one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, think about who are you going to follow for business advice yeah. or training advice if they don't look and act the part. I say it all the time. I'm not, I, I'm not gonna take business advice from somebody who used to do the thing. Right. What if, I wanna know who's living it now. And yeah. same thing with the strength training. Um, you know, I work with uh, the NHSCA, National High School Strength Coaches Association. Our goal is getting qualified, experienced, educated coaches in the weight room. Why? Because in many states, you know, not like Texas or South Carolina or Indiana, they have real strength coaches in. Right. But in a lot of states, 
It's just who's covering the weight room, yeah. who could write something up. Hey, you put that workout up. <clears throat> Have you ever done it? Right. Have you ever done squats, cleans, bench, military press, pull-ups, and the 10 other things in one session? And so I think this younger generation, <clears throat> but it's always been that way, but the younger generation really looks at the outside first. They uh, kind of assess you that way. Right. That is the opening door to trust, like you're saying, Anthony. And then from there is like, if you're not doing the thing, it's very hard to lead people down a road where they're going to be inspired by you, trust you to lead them. And so that's interesting that in our world of strength and conditioning, there's still people doing that, like trying to be a strength coach, but don't train. Right. That's why our interns for the first month, all they're doing is training mm -hmm. with kids. You're gonna train with a high school kid today, tomorrow a high school girl, next time a middle school kid, next time a kid with a broken hand, so you learn to work around injuries. That's right. All those little things that I don't think is, I can't really write about it in a book, but you gotta do the damn thing. Yeah. 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 This comes from experience. Experience, yeah. I think too, especially with, when we talk about training correlating to life is, training is a stressful stimulus that we are voluntarily signing up for, right? And putting ourselves through, and I often, when the kids are, we're grinding out and sometimes, you know, obviously we modify our sessions depending on what's going on season, off season or how their fatigue is, but we do have some ball buster sessions, which yeah, it's to get a good training session, but it's also to teach them, this is where I think my limit is. And we're going to push beyond that. And it's at the same time. And now I'm yeah. dealing it with, right. I just got married. I got a kid on the way. I bought a house and it's Stress. easy for me to make these excuses of why I can't train or why I can't sure. eat a certain way etc but then i reflect on hey like i've been here before i've done these hard things this is just another wall that i got to smash through and i can do it so it, it is empowering in that sense You're training I, the mental right stress muscle. yeah yeah 100 percent. we were chatting about this before we uh recorded is we were talking about the optimal guys like oh you're not training optimally and then we said well is it optimal when the lacrosse game goes into a tiebreaker am i optimal when Let's say like you and I have kids, you know, Joey just got married. You have a lack of sleep. Oh, I'm not training today. Once you have kids and you're running a business, optimal gets thrown out the window. So Anthony, maybe lead us with what we were talking about earlier with that. Well, I mean, I talk to my people all the time about, hey, there's optimal, uh, but then there's realistic. What can you actually sustain? What can you do? I've written people nutrition plans where I give them an exact meal plan, but then they're a husband and father, and I'm not gonna burden their wife with cooking an extra meal separate from dad. And I say, hey, here's your meal plan, eat these meals, eat whatever your wife cooks, here's some general parameters, make sure it has a protein, make sure you have one serving of carbohydrates, roughly the size of your fist. Is it the most optimal to get the fastest result? No. I mean, if he was a bodybuilder and had a show, he can't do that. But some guy training for life, or what about when you have, um, I train a lot of executives who are in airports three, four, five days a week. Yeah. Even, give, them even giving them macros is yeah. impossible right. because you're, you're not gonna hit that on the nose. What I'm a huge fan of in that situation is I'll say, hey, <clears throat> here's your calorie range goal. And I like, look, our maintenance calories is not one hard number. So I'll give them a little buffer. Like, hey man, I want you to get between 2,600 and 3,000 calories. Just get in there, that's success. And I want you between 180 and 220 protein. Just get in there. So he still has to be intentional, still has to be thoughtful. When he goes into the little, you know, uh, convenience shop in the airport, he's gonna have to grab some hard boiled eggs and beef jerky and a banana wow. instead of McDonald's. Yes. But if he has goals, he can do it. And all success looks like is get in between there. And when you land and you go to the steakhouse, you know, you can order that eight ounce um, filet mignon and get some steamed broccoli and don't eat all the rolls at the dinner table, right? right? So give them, give them things that they can do so that, again, it's just the difference between optimal and what you can actually sustain. Yeah. Training for life. But you know, when I first heard that was, I, at the first location I had, we only trained athletes. But then sometimes a random adult would come in and be like, hey, I see what you guys are doing. I remember, uh, man, I wish I could remember his name. He was like a computer engineer. He was awesome. Um, he couldn't do shit when he came in, but he wanted to train with the athletes. Yeah. And I always say like back then, maybe I wasn't smart enough. I just let people kind of jump in. So we started him with like our intro work and he's training amongst the teenagers and he's with us for several months. And now he's doing Zercher squats and uh, like we're on the good safe box. But back then I had the steel boxes. <laughs> 
And we were doing the box jumps, and the kid um, says to him, I, I gotta re I'll remember his name. I'm having like a forgetting. But they're like, what are you training for? And he says, to him, he's like, man, I'm training for life. <laughs> and I was like, dude, that is the ultimate answer. And he worked from home. He worked on computers. And he stopped training with us when he moved to uh, Texas, got hired by a, a tech company. But he was amazing. And it taught me that uh, he was older than me. So I would have been maybe mid-30s. It taught me that, oh, he just changed his mind about what he's capable of doing. Right. And he's able to do it, which is now that I'm like creeping up on age 50, I see other men my age have lost that edge. They've really, they, they don't believe in it. And I know you're helping out with um, our buddy Joe. You train yeah. his kids, but yeah. he's a busy guy running Jocko Fuel. He gets it done, man. You know, he finds a way to do it. Like I've, I've gone over where he just gets off a red eye and puts on his workout stuff, gets in there and gets it done. So when you see guys like that, you know, you got to just take any of those excuses in your brain, just like shut them out and put the work like, in. This is just what I do. Yeah, it's That's just right. how you operate. But it's, it's, it's habits, you know, and, it's, and like you said, it's behavioral. So it's like if you can build those habits that become ingrained in your system, you, you get to a point where you feel weird when you don't do those things. Yes. Like that, that's where it comes in. Um, but one thing I guess we can talk about too, like kind of piggyback off the optimal thing, and this is something we were talking about off camera, is I think in today's world where you have so much information and it becomes very polarizing, it's nice to hear guys who have a lot of conviction and this is like the way to do it, right? However, I think all of us are very in that gray area yes. where, where nuance and depends. But I will say one thing that I've seen lately, especially with a lot of the science and evidence-based things is they're looking for the optimal or perfect plan on paper. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times they forget just the hard work ethic and mindset you know, that can kind of offset this perfect optimal program. And especially being in here, man, like we all probably were training around the same time where it was hardcore, you got after it. And right. we all got pretty strong and pretty jacked. Maybe it wasn't the most optimal program, yeah. but we ach achieved those goals. I never heard of optimal until kind of this internet exploded. And Dave Tate has a great saying. He says, before you know what's optimal or too much, you need to actually learn like, oh, this is too much. You actually need to learn how to like redline. Right, and that's you, where I feel like people don't get nowadays. Yeah. Have you trying, kicked yeah, the, the shit out of yourself? Yeah. And by the way, sometimes um, <clears throat> you work with those younger athletes and I bet you, I, even with adults, I know I did this myself, some of them respond better when they do more than quote unquote they're supposed to. Like it messes with their confidence. Like you mentioned, um, one of the guys I used to work with at Lehigh, and he was, you know, now a young man, father, uh, Nate Brown. Nate used to, li he responded better to lifting heavy. For example, it's a great story. I remember training them, and I felt like we were about like a little bit past halfway into the season. Fatigue starts setting in on the wrestlers, traveling a lot, and I was like, man, I could feel the lack of energy. So I did a bodybuilding warm up to really get the blood flow going. And then at the end of the workout, I said, I'm going to teach you guys running the rack, which is, a, yeah. <laughs> which is an intensity technique I learned reading Arnold's encyclopedia around 1985. So I said, you guys will probably go up three different weights and go down. So you might curl like 40s for three to five reps, 50s, and maybe 60. And I remember Nate went up to the 110s. <laughs> and he, yeah. he, it looked more you know, like a hang clean. But then when that training session was over and everybody was pumped and ripping into the weights, even though I saw they were tired, I uh, would always check in with the coaches. And so I was sitting in the office with Coach Santoro, Coach Hughes, and I go, I got to tell you, team morale was down until we started curling. <laughs> That's right. And uh, so I quote unquote broke the rules. And I got to tell you, as a 48 and a half year old guy, sometimes that intensity makes me feel better. You can break the rules when you know the rules. There it is. Well, let me ask you a question about this, Anthony, because this came up. And Joe, I'm not sure if you work, how many adult older men you work with online, but both of you guys have the online coaching business. But when I asked what are questions, I, I made an Instagram video. I said, I'm going to ask Anthony about getting ripped as you get older. And people are like, yes. You know, so I always say like, I, I was leaner and muscular and never had belly fat until I started getting, until I started a business and became a dad. Like, sure. is, is okay. the uh, effect of stress 
yeah. truly what puts on belly fat and like men are just like, how do I keep my abs as I get quote unquote older? So older is creeping into that age 50. Yeah. Well, first off, abs are kind of overrated. Like I'll go ahead and say that. And, and a lot of, have listen, abs. listen, <laughs> what's, that, what's that saying? Like, look, any skinny dude can get abs, but yeah. you got to earn a back, there you right? Go. Like that's the, um, first abs off, matter. You heard it here first. <laughs> well, and also like people ask me what I do for my abs all the time. Um, I just genetically don't hold fat here as much. A lot of guys tend to have fat here. You don't want that there. That's a lot of visceral fat. That's kind of yeah. not good around your organs. I hold all of mine in my low back and my legs. I just got lucky that way but I could show abs at 20% body fat. So for me, mm. abs and judging my upper body are not a sign of total body fat and conditioning. Right. Um, How do you check your body fat? What's your... Uh, I mean, here's the thing. All of those body fat, whether you're using DEXA in body or using a caliper, all of them are accurate, but they're not precise. And the way I define the two is accurate says I'm gonna hit the, a dartboard, precise says I'm hitting the bullseye. None of them are precise. So I just tell people, pick a method and stick with that. Okay. It's at least directionally accurate. It, the, you know, your first reading might not be on the money, but if your goal is to lose body fat, just keep using the same thing and that particular instrument should be trending down. Right, so right? you get a consistent measurement. It, yeah. Exactly, so um, now I don't believe, like hormones and things like that play a role, certainly. But I think they play a role, not directly, but indirectly on behaviors that subconsciously we're not aware of. When you're stressed, you're not sleeping as well. When you're not sleeping as well, your ghrelin increases. When your ghrelin increases, you're gonna eat What's more. Ghrelin? Ghrelin's the hunger hormone, ah. right? That's the one that just makes you wanna eat everything. So you're a dad and you got a new kid that's like screaming and crying and your sleep's not great. Your cortisol and your stress hormone is higher. You want to do things to get that dopamine hit because you're stressed, that's natural. And so um, I think what ends up happening is, you know, we gradually we want to get that rest where we can. So we're less active and we're going to eat more. And, um, mm. you know, I get people saying, well, I don't, I don't eat that much. But then when you stop and count, you know, that mom is grabbing the two or three chicken nuggets off her kid's plate. Yeah. She's putting more cream in her coffee than she realizes. Yep. And this is happening four or five times throughout the day. Well, a good coach is probably not going to have somebody in a crazy high deficit, like maybe three to 500 calories. You can easily erase that. Or what happens typically is they're really good Monday through Friday, but they have no plan for the weekend. They're good Monday through Friday because they're structure. Kids yeah. go to school, I go to work, this is life. Yes. And then the weekend is a free for all. And one free day instead of a free meal can totally erase that deficit that you just right. Right. created. And it becomes a cycle. But what we do know about the data is that people actually don't really gain weight from spring, summer, and fall. People, t they're outside, they're active, they're going to yeah. ball games, walking around amusement parks. They gain weight during the holiday season and then they just don't lose it. Mm. And they do this year after year just after year pounding. after year and it compounds. Yeah. So um, I tend to like harp on all of my people. Hey, if the Christmas season is busy for you, one of my guys who's a CEO, Q4 is nuts for him. Oh yeah. And so I always say, hey, listen, it's very hard to build muscle, but it's super easy to maintain it. We're gonna cut you back to two full body training sessions a week. Our aim is really not forward progress. Our aim is no regression. So that in January, when you're ready to hit the gas again, yeah. we're not spending right, right, right. months coming out of a hole. And so I think sometimes people get caught in this all or nothing mentality that kills them because if they can't have, they create this plan, they're emotionally attached to getting the body of their dreams, and then they enter a season of life where they can't execute it perfectly or optimally, and so they just ditch it yeah, all together. That's what Joey was saying before we recorded. He's like, it's, you gotta, be, where we live, in the gray area, I think because we're experts is why we live in the gray, meaning, right. hey, it depends. Mm. So what, what about you, Joe, with like the online coaching? How are you, do you, like, what do you work with to help people whose aim is fat loss? Do you go the route of build more muscle? <laughs> I mean, my, my thing is always uh, like the, the cliche stand efforting compliance is a science. Yes. So I, I want to figure out what their lifestyle is like, like, what are their interactions you know, throughout the week and try to work with them the best we can. Basically the same thing that he had said, and that plan fluctuates and adapts accordingly. And I'm a big fan of the window kind of model as well, where if we can get them in that maintenance style range, we give them a buffer of some calories. It makes them feel better about it because they have more wiggle room in a sense. It still achieves the goal that we want, but I find often in this all or nothing mentality, that's where the problems happen. Like, especially me, gonna be a dad, right? We got all this stuff going on. 
I have been around enough dads and people in the industry to not have a fixed mindset of, I need to be trained the same way that I'm training right now, right? right? Because if I did, I would just throw it out the window, right. right? So now it's like, hey, like you said, maybe two or three sessions a week, full body, get it done under 60 minutes, okay? Like I can still maintain, it's not gonna be for forever, right. you know, but you have to be able to adapt. And it's the same thing with the clients I work with, especially if, you know, we have, they're structured Monday through Friday and the weekends, they're the weekend warrior type deal. Well, if we can get them in a good place during the week, or even if they have a, a bigger range during the weekend, but in the end of the whole weeks uh, of calories, it's still the, the calorie target we want, mm. then everybody's happy, right? So it, it really is just nuanced depending on the client. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, compliance is the science. I want them to be motivated to do it. I, I always use the scale of one to 10 on things, which I got, uh, from a couple habit books where if I said, Hey, you need to eat 3000 calories on a scale of one to 10, uh, 10 being the hardest one being the easiest. What's that number? If they said seven, well, then I got to change something around to finally get them down to where they say like a one to two, where it's almost really? like so easy oh, wow. and a no brainer because that motivates them right away. They get that dopamine. They're so like, you're dude, saying you don't say you fucking pussy. Yeah. 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 Well, it depends. <laughs> I have a funny story about uh, calling someone a pussy. He was, he's one of my good friends, and uh, Keith, if, when you watch this, he'll laugh. Uh, this is a couple years ago. I just, I programmed some ab wheel rollouts for this guy. He's like an MMA dude, whatever. Yeah. And he messages me, and he's like, hey man, these are like, these are killing. And I'm like, well, they're not fun, but you know, just suck it up and whatever. And, uh, and then he texts, he messages me the next day. He's like, dude, every time I do this, I have just searing pain in my abs. Like it's like, and I said, hey, why don't you try five sets of five of not being a pussy? <laughs> <laughs> and he's a good friend, okay? I don't do this to all my clients, he's right? Yeah. Somebody's gonna be a fan. No, 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 no. The next day he goes to the doctor and he had a hernia. <laughs> I was like, no. yeah, you know what? That's funny is like, I've, uh, through the years, I've gotten more conservative. Like you just never know what the heck is wrong with somebody when they're like, hey, my knee, you know, or somebody will say, my knees bother me, my elbows bother me. Yeah, well, let's just work around it. I have this kind of rule that if in two weeks there is zero um, reduction of that pain area, I'm referring you out to a doctor. You're going to get an x-ray. And uh, when that started was we had a young middle school kid went to a quarterback camp, and I think it was three days. So imagine how many reps he's doing. He comes back from the quarterback camp, <clears throat> and he's like, my elbow bothers me a little bit. <laughs> But he could do recline row, he could do pull-ups, but any pushing hurts. So I'm like, okay, <clears throat> elbows just probably bothered from that. <laughs> Two weeks later, I tell his dad, listen, his elbow still hurts, he can't do a push-up, he can't press at all. So I said, just take him to a doctor, get an x-ray. Dad calls me later, he's like, he's got a broken elbow. I was yeah. like, dude, he went to that quarterback camp and must have just going and going and going. And so, you never know what is breaking somebody. For us, it could be a warm up, but for somebody else. Yeah. How, do you how do you help your athletes differentiate? So the rule that I tell all of my people is, yep. we never push through pain, yes. we always push through discomfort. But that requires them to know, I'm like pain is like sharp, stabbing, searing, maybe pulsating or like electrical type feelings, yep. like nerve pain. Don't push through that. I can't like, get in yeah, this. Yeah, don't do that. This but if something is me. sore or achy, like let's try to work around that. Yeah, let's push get a warm up. Let's get the blood flow right. going. Then let's roll it out. Why do I, do, why do I get blood flow? Because right. as you guys know, when we get a pump, we feel better. It elevates somebody's mood. So sometimes it's in their head. Then number two, I just try them to chill out a little bit. Hey, roll out on the areas that are sore and tight. Then we go from there and kind of what we've been harping on is I'm living in that gray area. I'm, I am experienced enough and past the point of saying you have to do this. If it's not agreeing with them, either physical or mental, because that the mental yeah, sure. can guide the physical, I'm just, <clears throat> yeah, I've always got plan yeah. B. Yeah. And uh, one thing I tell our coaches, especially our interns, is never underestimate just how weak somebody can be. Don't assume that doing push-ups is a normal thing for high school yeah, kids. Don't assume that they could do this warm-up. Don't assume that they could train in this heat. All of these things just, right, yeah. but whereas my early days, 
I was crazy. <laughs> I was crazy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's in, that's why it's yeah. interesting that you said on the scale of one to ten. I was like, oh my God, you're getting them to a one or two. I was thinking seven is where I want because if we're if we're talking school, seven is a seventy percent. That's a C minus. You're at a C minus. Let's get to a C minus. No, we're gonna give you a one and a two. I just want you to attack. And I try that to, to build that. I want the wins right away. You know, like I want to build the momentum because it's tough when you. And I'm sure you've worked with clients where. If they don't see the progress within the first one to two weeks, they automatically start, the mental side picks up of they're failing. You know, I'm never gonna get to where I wanna be. So, you know, sometimes even in the beginning when technically I know maybe we should put muscle on or, or mass, depending on their goals, I may put them in a deficit and cut because I know for that client, they're gonna get that high of like, dude, yeah, I look and feel really good. That's so critical. I've been learning, I'm, I know that intellectually, I have been applying that more. In fact, I'm working on something right now for all of my clients. Like whenever my clients come to me, we do an initial video chat. We're talking about their goals, big picture. How but, long is an initial video chat? 15 minutes, do you uh, cap it? Or an hour? Mine's I, like an hour. I was gonna say, mine are usually, <laughs> talk, me too, me too. <laughs> I, I'm a big believer in if they have the why behind things, they're gonna buy, so 45 minutes to an hour so usually. So they already signed up to train with you? Um, so I get a lot of people that have never spoken to me and I'll just get an order to come through my website, which yeah, is always odd, but I get that. And so then. They kind of, uh, they're kind of like Joe, how he said he came to the first cert you're watching the video so much you feel like you know the that's guy? It, that's it so there was a guy uh luke if you're watching this he, he messages me on uh on x or twitter or whatever we're doing these days and uh and he signs up he goes hey bro i just signed up and i said hey did you want to i'm happy to schedule a video chat with you and kind of walk you through how i do things yep. he goes no nah, man I've been following you for years i trust yes, you what do i need to do yeah. and i'm like okay the we... word is following you for years right and trust <clears throat> right yep. and uh and so no i think i think that's huge but um yeah, I do those. I do those consults with people and um, and explain to them. But something I've been doing recently is, I'll try to explain to them the big picture, and I have it in my head. But they forget after that first conversation, after a right. week or two. Right. So I've been trying to get them emotional wins, but also I'm trying to. Something I'm doing is creating a document of their personal roadmap, so that I can give them signposts along the way to show what success looks like. Because success is going to look different so in every phase that they're in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it might just be a Word doc I turn into a PDF yes. or something. Um, but I want them to, you know, and not timelines. I'm not a huge fan of timelines because it really is based on their compliance. Yep. But I want them to know, hey, we're in this phase right now. And ideally, if life doesn't happen and you're, you give me 90 plus percent compliance, it should roughly take this long. Right. This is how we're defining success. Well, you know, when I'm taking somebody, a female who wants to lose weight, but she's been eating really low calories and we need to get her calories up first. Well, um, we're not gonna be focusing on the scale. In fact, that might go up a little bit. Right. So we better have some other success measures in place. So do, she's gonna photos? be, well, photos, measurements, um, but then also this is a perfect time to focus on performance in the gym. Let's yeah, get strong. Because we're putting yeah. calories in, so let's hit some PRs. Yeah. Let's That's get what it. Brett Contreras does with all these women. That's they're right. on a power bodybuilding program That's right. with a, I think they're eating pretty much like a vertical diet, high protein, yeah. moderate right. carbs, and then the healthy fats. That's right. And I, the vertical diet to me is seem it's like the most common sense. It's not extreme no. keto or what's, um, you know, yeah. paleo and all this stuff. I do a lot of uh, vertical diet during hunting season because it's easy i'll make a lot of mash and yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. throw it in a thermos cool and event, eat a lot of venison. well no just because i'm out in the woods all day long so i'll just cook i'll yeah. just cook up a bunch of uh beef and rice and throw some veggies in there and you know put bone broth in there and put it in a big old thermos so when i'm sitting out in the deer stand for eight hours oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll take you out, dude. oh man yeah. my bu my other buddy joe you know i know joe's busy but he's like i'll show you how to shoot in the gym the bow he's like and then we'll go out hunting yeah, and so it, man. i'm uh, one of the kids we train actually he graduated high school so he's no longer training with us but his dad and him go hunting so they would bring me uh the backstrap oh, and the ground really beef part. yes All what's right. i've cooked backstrap before the ground beef i'll mix with uh regular beef what's um you know interesting you guys mentioned i want to go back to the uh the the training time and eating near the holidays marty gallagher many years ago he lives in Pennsylvania. He said, he called it seasonal eating. Kind of like what you guys were just saying, like in that winter time, 
I'm eating more stew, more soups, more heavy, um, hot, you know, uh, protein fats. He's like, then in the spring and summer, it's salads and fruits and fish. And um, you also mentioned the training. When I do my online programming from a little bit before Thanksgiving to the new year, I do a minimalist program with a twice a week, third optional, just because I know we're shopping, we're running around, we're this, we're that. So talk about the, what do you guys do, both living in Pennsylvania, cold weather, do you do a seasonal eating in the winter or what is it? I mean, I, for my clients, they're all over the world. Yep. So it's based on their goals and what's going on. So I wouldn't say I have a specific approach for seasonal. It's whatever they what happen to be in. Personally? Me personally, I mean, I've been winter competing time. for the last 10 years. This is going to be the first year where I don't have some big competition on the books. So like right now, my current training is I'm training three days a week in the gym. I'm getting back into some running and rucking yep. and that. I'm doing jujitsu a couple times a week. Um, and so, and I'll probably do that through the fall because I want to get out in the woods a lot. Yes. So there might be some weeks where I get four days in in the gym. There might be some weeks where I get two. Right. Um, but I'm just training for fun because I love it. I don't have this ultimate yeah. end goal. I may compete in jujitsu a couple times. Yeah. But um, yeah, you're it's just, training for life now. That's right. That's so right. So your personal. So this winter will be your first time not competing in strongman. <laughs> in like in a, 10, decade. a decade. Or, well, I didn't compete. I stopped competing in strongman in 2021. Okay. Um, and, and pivoted over to bodybuilding, but this will be my first time not competing in any sort of bodybuilding or yeah. or strongman. Jiu-jitsu is a little different. You yeah. can just decide to throw down on a weekend competition if yeah. you want. You Which know? is so great. It's, it's not like it doesn't require a 12 week sort of right. intensive. You're always ready. That's right. Yeah. That's that's the difference. So what about you, Joe? your nutrition as the weather gets cold for you. Yeah, yourself. so right now I do have a, a strongman competition scheduled for September. Now I was just talking to him about, Where I just, uh, Maryland actually. Oh, yeah, Ocean City, Maryland. Nice. So with now having a house we're putting together, baby, wedding, a lot going on, summer type stuff like that. You know, if I do compete, it will, won't necessarily be the best prep in terms of previous because I didn't have all these things going on. That was more I want to say the focus and identity where now it's like, I want to compete because I enjoy it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, Hey, whatever happens, happens as long as I bring my best foot forward. If I wasn't competing and how I've done it in the past is I like to periodize my year. Right? So for me, like I kind of like the staple, if I'm going to put mass on, I do in the winter time, I'm sure. eating heartier food. We have the holidays, that type of deal. Yep. And then in the summer, that's when I'm going to lean out. Like it's just always made sense that way because you're out in the sun more, you're going to be going to the beach. Like, how many shredded guys do you see like in the winter? Like you don't take pride of being shredded in the winter. Like I've just never understood that. Um, so for me, that's kind of how my training would, uh, you know, revolve around. I'm pretty active with being outside, hunting, that kind of stuff. So it also depends on my hobbies because my hobbies will fluctuate depending on the season as well. Um, but I just kind of always, and that's how I view it. Just same probably with Anthony, how we assess our clients is that bird's eye, you know, thousand foot view of where are we at now? where's kind of the end goal rough timeline and then how do we make those uh micro cycles to get there uh and and a, kind of to his point too is you want to write that out because often what i find with clients is they have this intention they start down this path and then sometimes they have uncertainty click in especially uh, with men or women who have to put on size or weight right they, they've kind of maybe have made progress because they've always wanted to be centered around this one image and they're afraid to branch out. Mm. So it's kind of for me like, hey, I have to remind you, like this is what we gotta do, this is why we're doing it, right. and assure them that it's the right, right path to take. Um, and, and by doing that, you, you know, it, it helps. Maybe get sidetracked with something busy, and then they're like, ah, I don't know if I wanna right. do, do that. Or just so I know you, you work, I think, with more women than I do, but when you have to get uh, a woman to eat more, yep. right, which you know in the end result will get them the physique that they want, but it's very challenging to, to have them really buy into that. And often they'll get maybe a month in, see the scale weight going up or how much food they're not used to eating. And then they get this like panic of, man, like this is going to mess my body image up. But I have to remind them that, hey, at the end of this, yeah. you're going to this is going to be the way that you really want to look. And this is what's been keeping us from getting there. And so you do have to work with, you know, the psychology of it, you know, the training aspect, but. I also think you battle the overabundance of information that confuses. 100%, 100%. That confuses oh yeah, like people. I've got people who text me, hey, I just read this and we're doing this. What do you think? Yeah, I just Googled you know? this. Don't ever go, you know. Yeah. <laughs> What's what we know from business is that the, the uh, 
highest quality information is not the first answer on Google. It's just maybe what's most popular. Yeah. Or I think what's people trending? don't have the ability to discern the Correct. speaker's intended audience. Ooh. So um, I might give advice that's really good for a bodybuilder that is trash for a powerlifter. And the powerlifter doesn't understand that. And they hear this guy who's big and jacked um, speaking authoritatively on right, a thing, right. and they think, well, I need to be doing that thing. Like, no, you're training for something different. Context. I, I deal with that a lot with the high school athletes, right? Like we have, we talked about Sam Sulik earlier, right? Who's probably the biggest teenage demographic. So I do high school strength and conditioning on top of coaching the actual sport of lacrosse. But when I go in the weight room, what is our goal, right? Our goal is to help aid in performance for the yes. sport. Yep. Yeah, we'll still do some bro sessions because who doesn't love That's to right. get after and get a good pump, but we can't have every single session to be a bodybuilding Sam Sulik workout, but they, in their brains, go and see this yes. and they go, oh, this is what I want to look like and this is who I want to be. And it's contradicting of what Coach Joe is saying. Right. So what do we do, right? And that's where it's got to be in the gray area. Hey, if we do X, Y, and Z, this is going to make you better at sport. How about 15 minutes of just blasting buys, tries, whatever right, at the right. end. Then they're like, okay, I like that more. Please them yeah. mentally. And by the way, like I've experienced athletes who train you know, by copying bodybuilders and they, and yes, they're consistently slow. They right. could, everything right. hurts them in sport because they don't do box jumps. They don't yeah. do aggressive. I have to explain that all the time. Like, power. like, you know, the ideal physique that you see up there, like Chris Bumstead looks great. Everybody thinks he, that's probably not what the ideal athlete looks like. Right. True. Right. Like that's, that's, these are two different goals. Yeah. If you want to pursue that at some point, great. But that's not what it's also doing. like if you were to take Chris Bumstead, and I'm sure there's other guys that would break this model, but because they're just freaks, but you put him into a sport, yeah. right? Where he's at now, like you would see visually like, yeah, this doesn't like this guy oh. can't compete, you know, with with where the, uh, the kids or goals are, are trying to aim towards. It's different things like um, I it was a video. What, what was it? A couple years ago, there was a big event down at Attilus. Um, and there was some bodybuilders, I mean, jack dudes, and they wanted me to teach them how to do a strongman log press. Right. And it was, I mean, these guys have 500 plus benches yep. and it was hilarious watching them try and right, lap right, yeah. and pick even like 200 pounds or they're, just stumble. Yes. They, their, their central nervous system is nervous system is so it hasn't been trained. So I equate it to this, you know, you mentioned school. I always say to kids, you know, let's say you take uh, Spanish in high school but then you don't speak Spanish for the right. 10 weeks of summer. You come back, you feel like you have forgotten all Spanish. So I said, when you're training slow and on all these machines, and then your sport requires you to be explosive and agile and aggressive, your body doesn't know how to hit that gear because you've never, you've never trained in that manner. And so, you know- Training skills as well, right? Like yes. you look at a, you look at a open bodybuilder and they look jack and they are strong. Um, relative, but then you put them up against a world-class MMA fighter that doesn't look anything like them, that MMA fighter is gonna rock their world. Which is, by the way, why I've always loved kind of the silver and golden era. The silver era, silver era of bodybuilding, those guys actually were, they were weightlifters, powerlifters, and bodybuilders. So talk about like the seasons. Right. They were able to do it all. And then those old magazines like uh, Iron Man and Strength and Health, you would always see um, weightlifting, bodybuilding, hand balancing, so like gymnastics. Think about Arnold's early days in California on Muscle Beach. Everybody doing acrobatics. He would be on the beach running and swimming and playing volleyball, which is, as you, we were talking earlier about um, Special Forces guys, is that when they're doing their field work, we understand that that's actually training. Yeah. So by them sprinting and shooting and this and that, we might actually be able to supplement it with some basic bodybuilding work because they've already done their explosive quote unquote sport. You know, they're sure. well, I've been they're like training. looking back at like uh, the Europeans, right? Like if you want to get some really good training information, you look at how the Europeans did it. 100%. And when they had, it wasn't a gym, it was a training hall. And you have these young kids who the end goal is to be, you know, Olympians, whatever, but they're doing gymnastics. They're doing, uh, different technical, like they're very the well-rounded model. As 100%. much as people hate the Russians and there was all the doping stuff. You don't hate them because you ain't them, right. you know? <laughs> the truth is their training model <laughs> Delete. is the yeah. best because they developed those young athletes through overall athleticism. 
Then they found where they were best suited physically and mentally. They let them go into that sport. So if you were shorter, you could be a weightlifter, a wrestler, a gymnast. If you were naturally lighter, if you were taller, you were probably a track and field athlete, basketball. Yeah, they moved you into what suited sure. your, not just your physical needs, but the mental needs. Right, and right. so it's interesting that, you know, that information's out there for the experts, but it's still a struggle to yeah. educate uh, parents and just other people about, hey, this is actually the best way for you to train for this sport. And I think, listen, like this is, I'm living it. I've never seen so many injuries the past decade. They just keep increasing. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm going back and utilizing early underground strength methods because I'm finding that it's needed now more than ever. Like the kids lack the, not just the physicality, but this mindset that we've been discussing about yeah. being aggressive and attacking. Right. And so I'm seeing athletes that are not just underprepared physically, but psychologically. Well, I learned anecdotally with me. So kind of the couple years after college era, I always trained like an athlete, but I would dabble in Olympic lifting and kind of different training methodologies, which made me well-rounded. Yes. So when I got into strongman, I was not the strongest guy by any means, but I was athletic to kind of capitalize on those weak areas. So now, you probably won all the farmers and the yokes and all of that stuff. It was even like I, with it, the max deadlift and the max. Yeah, deadlift. like so, it was just any static events I had to build up. But if you had like a like I would do clean and jerks instead of a strict press. Or I push remember press. watching your early weightlifting videos. Yeah, yeah. Your his name on the underground strength forum was Yuri. <laughs> yeah. After um, what's it? What was the famous weightlifter? Yeah, Yuri. Yuri, Yuri yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Um, That's great. But uh, this is alter ego. But what I found, though, on the flip side of that is once I started to really push the static numbers and pull back from that athletic movements, injuries started popping up. So now it's like I'm at the point where I have the wisdom. And don't get me wrong. Everybody needs to go down their path. And yep. that's how you, you know, you gain wisdom. But for me, it's like, hey, I, I probably should incorporate more athletic style movements, different planes of motion, probably, you know, get a little bit more you know, speed, power, explosiveness and stuff in there or doing more cleans because I, you know, I took that out. Um, and I as a coach, it's tough because I'll come into these high schoolers and I'm like, hey, here's the golden key of everything that I wish I knew at your age that I w I'm going to give you. And it's up to you if you want it or not, That's you know, right. and it's like maybe we get 20 to 30 percent which is like, hey, but I'm doing everything I can. It's the timing. Yeah. Um, and everybody before I said the same thing though too. Right, and right. that's what's irritating is because I look back and I'm like, man, if I would change so much about how I trained, yeah. like I don't <laughs> regret it because it made me who I am yeah, and yeah. I've learned, but I would, train, I would change so much about what, my nutrition. What would be like three crucial changes you would have made to your younger Oh, uh, easy. So, your sports, by well, the way, so uh, I played soccer and basketball yep. in, in high school. In high and school. then, but then in, for strongman wise, okay. Um, I would go in and let's say I'm supposed to hit a heavy three on the log and it's supposed to be like a RPE eight. Realistically, I'm trying to hit an RPE 12, yeah, you know, right. the heaviest Same triple possible, just sending yourself. it. Yeah. But then like I see the accessories, oh, incline dumbbell press, and I'm just kind of going through the motions. If I could just, one little tweak would be like, leave a little more in the tank on my compounds. Optimal main, the compounds. Yeah, and then go way harder on the accessories and Max. athletic stuff. There were so many times I'm like, I don't feel like doing those lunges. I do like one half ass set down and back. Are fucking hard. Right. Bulgarian split squats, who likes those? Um, <laughs> you know, all the ab work, the hollow rocks and yes. like the, all that kind of stuff that, you know, isn't sexy for the gram. Right. But the 3 RM, you know, 315 yeah, log press, that legs. looks good. Yeah. But but then oh, injuries. So pam, interesting pam, pam. that you say that because I asked myself I wonder how many injuries have happened Social media. for people who are just trying to do it for the camera. You're trying to lift heavier than you're supposed to. Matt Wenning said something interesting on his recent YouTube, I think. He said, max effort doesn't mean go to failure. It means like maximum effort to stimulate the growth in that area and then move on, which I think- you know, day. like it's not, it's not gonna be the same every single day. Oh yeah. So know? technically I think it's like, you're going to a technique max, because I think the big lifts are what beat us up the most. Oh, sure, sure. And so if you're killing those big lifts, and like you said, not focus, and I think that happens to, with uneducated coaches running the weight room. They're killing the cleans, and kids are catching wide, shitty technique, 
I'm, but you see it celebrated on ESPN. Oh, oh doesn't God. it kill you? Yeah. And they're like, this kid. And they're I'm like, wow. as they should show. They should show the opposite of all the fail videos that they don't put up there because yes. they're picking out like the one, the point one percent of the videos to actually. Show. I tell the kids, we're going to use cleans as our speed movement. Yeah. And I go, you could go heavier on your trap bar deadlift, box squat, yeah. something that's less skill required. Not that those exercises don't require skill, sure. but the clean has too much. You know, like I said, I've gotten conservative. I look at how everything could go wrong and it's just, yeah. you know, do we need this? But one thing I, I keep wanting to talk about, and then uh, I want to hear Joe's um, changes that he would have made when he was younger as an athlete. I saw you, we were mentioning experts giving polarizing information. Um, Dr. Mike Isratel is an awesome dude, but he made a recent video with, um, Bobby Stroop training, uh, who's the uh, quarterback? Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes yeah. Okay. And he's like, why is Mahomes yeah, doing slow position. eccentrics and isometrics? He's like, you don't want to do that. You're never in those positions. Well, a couple of things I wanted to say. Dr. Mike is often right about a lot. He's a very smart guy. He's also funny as hell. I like it. But in that video, he's wrong because isometrics have been, there's research that shows it improves uh, joint stability, which is crucial if I want Mahomes to stay healthy, so it builds durability. Um, Dan Fichter, who's in upstate New York, he does research on heavy eccentrics, drop-offs, and long isometric holds. He said it actually improves Somebody speed. Somebody needs to, to slip him triphasic training. Right. <clears throat> That's what he's basically doing. And yeah, so, so, so Mike is creating videos that are polarizing because you're kind of saying something well, it's, it's, very it's good or bad. Grabbing. It's attention grabbing, but the truth is what Bobby Stroop is doing with Patrick is crucial to keeping him healthy because right. in right. sport, I actually want to utilize some stuff that doesn't put you in the perfect position. Yeah. We were talking about this earlier. If you don't train eccentrics, you don't know how to decelerate. That's what injuries happen. Or yeah. what if I'm in like, um, you know, I think a lot about combative athletes. I remember using sandbags 20 plus years ago and the kid was like struggling to pick it up. He's like, it's awkward, it's fucking hard. I go, that's why we want it. He was yes. like crouched down, leaning to one side. I said, that's actually- Real life. Per yeah, it's real for wrestling. So Mel Siff actually wrote about it in Super Training. There's a little like page or half page and it's just called Imperfect Training, which actually is good for parents. How do uh, adults get hurt? They don't get hurt they playing. Get bad position or they something. get hurt picking up their baby. They get hurt putting on a seat yeah. belt. And grab something. Yeah. Oh, there's a cue yeah. Right there. So that being said, I want to do stuff that safely and progressively puts you in quote unquote imperfect. So we are training to me, that's training for life and it's training for sport. Like if I look at injuries that happen, it's because the athlete didn't train end range motion and I'm not as dialed in as Dan Fichter on the neurology and Buddy Morris has videos on this, but they say like an ACL tear is not just muscular, it's neurological. Maybe the leg gets hyperextended or it gets put into a position right. so fast that the body and mind haven't been You can control, yeah. but get some um, imperfect training that best prepares them for sport or life. A couple of things I can add to that that were in my brain is first one talking about putting them in weird positions. Well, a lot of times we'll have athletes that say they're cramping. And for, for my knowledge, I know that they're actually hydrated, but the issue is that they haven't put their muscle into that position, which yep. causes the cramp response. But then if we look at it from uh, that perspective, that hurts their performance, yes. right? Because now they're worried about cramping. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not going to do a certain movement because they're worried about a cramp, which they think psychologically, hard. yeah, happened, yep. Happened. But they yeah. also think it's because I need hydration, but it, no, this is something that we can control in the weight room of putting you in these weird positions to get your neurological system Build to realize, concepts. yeah, that this is okay. So when they go in those positions, they're fine. Um, the thing referring back to Dr. Mike, and I love Dr. Mike, he was a training partner of mine for a couple of years. Um, but it's really, I think the idea of those- Dr. Mike's gonna block us on Instagram now. <laughs> <laughs> He'll make another video. His, uh, <laughs> He'll make a video yeah, laughing yeah. at us. But, I and, and I don't know the context, but I think the main point I wanna make is knowing the context of, yes. if you're going to make these videos, 
have you talked to the, the trainer or the coach? Do you yeah. know what was going through their philosophy with this? Um, or if you make those videos, play both your uh, thoughts and devil's advocate. Well, hey, I could see why they would do this for this yeah. reason. Uh, but it is frustrating when you are just kind of pulling out the trending people or themes. And obviously the majority of people want something that's going to be catchy and, uh, you know, counter you know, intuitive of what a lot of people right. think. Sure. Uh, but I think context is, is huge with it's that. It's interesting how that, you know, a friend of mine said this to me a couple of years ago. He's like, Zach, you know why your early days of underground took off? He's like, because you were very black and white. You were flipping tires. You're lifting stones. You're cursing at people. He's like, now you, you're a dad. You're smarter. You've got this kind of middle of the road. He's like, you're saying sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. He's like, people don't really want to hear that. People want to pick it's a tough. side, it's tough. It's which tough. is why did CrossFit win in the beginning? They were like, this is the functional training, they period, still, I think they end still of story. <laughs> I think they still believe that. But a lot of people have kind of yeah. fallen. Well, you, you know, see a lot of people, not to get too into it, but pulling away because they realize now, say they were whatever cross it with their name, now it's so-and-so fitness because they're starting to see that there are different dynamics to fitness, not many, just nine movements ways. executed, you yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the elite stars of CrossFit, they don't do wads all day long. That's right. That's not what they do. They're doing strong They're doing man, strong man. they're doing power lifting, they're doing power building, body power building, building, nine yeah. months out of the year, and then they're peaking yep, right. for that competition, just like every other athlete. Right. Peaks you, for the you know what, um, I'm going to say the last thing and then let you guys close out with your ideas, but I met Ed Cohn at uh, Sornex Summer Strong. Ed the man. Yeah. yeah, and it was so great to hear how um, just kind of matter of fact he was. You know, uh, he mentioned doing sets of 12 with deadlifts, and I was like, do you do, you know, he mentioned the higher rep ranges. Yeah. And I said, do you do 12s with the deadlift? Because normally I would only do like fives and triples. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, you got to get in shape to get in shape. So I went on a phase of doing 12s, 10, 8, 6, yeah. 4, 2. And at first I was like, this shit's going to kill me. And then two, three weeks into it, your body stops yeah. rejecting it. Yep. And also my mind, you know, mentally I'm like, I'm like, damn, I'm going so much lighter to do 12 reps, but I had to play the long game. So it was cool to hear how uh, people were saying like, how did you know, you know, it was too heavy, too light. He, you know, cause you don't have, um, you're not um, track uh, checking your velocity. He's like, if it felt good, you know, I knew it was right. If the bar move, I could see if the bar's moving fast. And so that is the coach's eye. So I would ask coaches who are very technology based is what if the kid hits like, um, you know, the velocity is very high on the clean, but the technique is bad. Do you count it? What if the velocity is great on the squat, but he only went halfway down and technically he was supposed to get to parallel. Do you still count it? That's where the coach's eye comes in and we say, hey, you know, you hit the number I want here when we're tracking velocity, but we're going to go a little lighter because I need you to get lower. Right. I need the full range. So right. it's the, it depends. So what would you guys, you know, message to close out here on anything? It depends. Yes. <laughs> it depends. It's the most annoying answer, but it's the most honest answer Correct. because yeah, people will message me all the time and say, what do your programs look like? And I say, well, we got to meet and talk first. I have no idea about you or your life, your injury history, yes. your goals, what you do for a job. All of that stuff factors in. Right. And then I'll build your program from there. And it could look however it needs to look. Love it. You know, there's, I have broad principles that I apply to everybody, yes. but they don't look the same. They're just in principle, hey, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Nice. But then how that looks in the real world is going to depend on our conversation. Love it. Anthony, just tell them what's the uh, way to follow you. Yeah, so I'm uh, Meathead Professor on Instagram, um, Coach Anthony D on X, if you're there, and Anthony Deal on Facebook. D I E H L. D I E H L. Yep. Yeah, I'll piggyback everything off of Anthony, what he just said. Uh, I guess the only things I would add from my perspective would be something is always better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So don't overcomplicate things in your head or get paralysis by analysis and not train or not, you know, eat something that maybe is, you know, not the best, but it's not the worst, like, you know, do that. Um, and then on top of that would be, don't forget about the blue collar mindset, baby. You know, like there, there's, there's power in just getting after it. Um, kind of 
reiterating the point of paralysis by analysis. I think we have a lot more of that and I understand why it's like that. But at the same time, like go in there and just hit it hard. And I guarantee you, if you do that over time, you're going to be far ahead of where you would be if you didn't do those things. Right. Grunt, like some good old fashioned grunt work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Joey, where should people connect with you? Uh, everything is going to be under Zat Strength, so S Z A T, and then the word strength on all platforms. Uh, so just search that in Google and you'll find all my stuff. Good. Uh, guys, last thing I want to say. Uh, wh wherever you're watching this, share with a friend. If you're listening, leave her a five-star review on Apple. That helps us spread the word of the strong life. And uh, free training courses, go to ZachStrength.com, Z-A-C-H-Strength.com. Super pumped that my friends Anthony and Joey came out here. First time meeting Anthony in person, but we've been talking a lot back and forth. We didn't tackle much uh, business stuff, but all three of us do consulting with business, whether it's online or gym. So reach out to us, hit us up with questions, and thanks to everybody for watching. Until next time, it depends. <laughs> That's right. Yes.